series right now called The Invitation, going through um, talking about the good news as we see it in the Christmas story. So as we see it in the Bible verses that are about Christmas. And we've talked about week one, Tyler taught on the power of the gospel, the power of the good news change lives, that the gospel changes lives. And if you're unfamiliar with a churchy word like gospel, what we're really talking about is the good news that Jesus came and died for our sins and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven and will return one day. And that because of that, he offers us life and healing. He offers us freedom and joy in him, even in the hardest times. And so the good news is that the kingdom of God has come like the Lord's Prayer would tell us, we pray for his kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven, right? And so that is what we have now. So that's the good news that changes lives. And so we talked last week about actually we have a, we have a, a mandate from God, a calling from God to tell people about the good news. And one of the ways we can do that is through invitation. And so today we're going to talk about a different way. So we're going to go right back into the story. Even if you're not a churchgoer, you've heard this before. You've heard this read before. So we're just, this is, uh, the angels come and they appear to the shepherds right there. There were shepherds out in the field at night. You've all heard that, right? And the angels say, you know, we have great uh, good news that will produce great joy for all people. And that's the introduction to that word, the gospel, good news for all people, Okay. And so when the angels had left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph. Remember, the angels had told them what they would find. You'll go and you'll find this baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger. And so they found this baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said. And so this is the second one. The first idea is how can we participate in the good news? We can be inviters. You know, and inviting people to church is obviously an easy way to do that. But we can be inviting people to, the whole idea is we invite people to Jesus. So if you missed last week's teaching, go listen to it. But now, here's another one. When they uh, had seen him, they spread the word concerning him. So in the Bible, I find a couple different ways that we can tell people about the good news. We can say, come and see, which is what we talked about last week. Right? Come and see what God is doing. It requires nothing on our part other than just issuing an invitation. There's also go and tell. And we'll see that all through scripture that followers of Jesus are encouraged to go tell people about the faith. And then there's go and do. Okay, so that is showing people the goodness of the gospel. So today we're talking about go and tell. And I want to tell you that this is my least favorite of the three. So let's just be honest. You're sitting here, you're thinking, Christian's going to tell us that we have to go tell people about our faith. I'm ready to go home. Church was going well. We were like through the songs quick. Josh was quick. He didn't make any mistakes. And now he's up here telling us to talk about our faith to people. It just got bad. And, and I get it. Like, this is my least favorite of these three to talk about for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm not very good at this. I, I, I don't, like, I try to have stories, like, of myself doing the things that I'm encouraging other people to do, because I don't want to be one of those people who tells you to do stuff I'm not willing to do. I don't have a lot of stories of me talking to people about, like, I, I invite people all the time. I'm very good at the come and see. But I'm not great at, like, hey, here's this person. Let me tell them about my faith. Let me get into it. Let's talk about Jesus, and, you know, let's bring it up. Let's talk about your need for a Savior, or, you know, like, it's just not my forte. Another reason I don't love this one is that I feel like it's uncomfortable. Like as soon as I start talking about it, like you need to talk about your faith with your neighbors, with your coworkers, with your family members. We all are like, that's weird. That's uncomfortable. That is maybe even like not a good idea. Like maybe that's even counterproductive to the whole idea of trying to spread the good news. If I start talking about my faith at work, I'm going to be that guy. You know, I'm going to be that girl that people are annoyed about. And I get it. Like, it is uncomfortable. This week, I invited several people to our Christmas Eve Eve service. I told you at the end of last service, I had three people I was going to invite. I invited all three of them. I just want you to be accountable to you. So you know, I'm not just telling you to do this stuff. And it was awkward. And I invited them over text. Just so you know, I didn't, like, go face to face. But, like, these are people I'm, I, like, are not, uh, well, two of the people. One's my brother. But two of the people are not people who, I don't know anything about their faith. I don't know if they're churchgoers. I know them through my kids' school and through soccer teams and stuff. And so, like, you really are, even just with an invitation, you're, you feel like, am I crossing a line relationally that we can never return from? You know, like, are you going to think of me different? Are you going to feel weird around me? 
You know, so I'm like, I, I invite him and then I'd write, you know, no pressure in as many different ways as possible, right? No pressure, you know, I don't want to ruin our relationship, blah, 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 blah. you know, like, it's so weird. I would never do that if I was like, hey, we're having a party, you guys are invited, but no pressure, don't feel, I hope it doesn't ruin our relationship, you know, like, but church is like a different beast. And so I just wanted them to feel comfortable saying no, but it's awkward. And it's even worse if you're like, hey, you want to come to church? Let me tell you about my faith in Jesus. Does anybody agree? It's a little bit awkward to talk about your faith. And, and a third reason is I, I really don't want to talk about this. Hopefully by the time I'm done, I won't have to, okay? But I really don't want to talk about this because I don't want anyone to leave feeling pressure. I don't want you to leave feeling, because I think that pastors can do this in a way that makes you feel condemned or makes you feel obligated or makes you feel like you're not a good Christian if you're not talking about your faith. And so I don't want that to happen. And I want to just acknowledge that I'm not good at it. Okay, are we all on the same page? All right, but we have to talk about it anyway. Here's the thing. If we're going to preach the Bible, which is kind of my job, you can't get away from this. There, the Bible is, like, unfortunately not unclear. Like, there's some things you can, in the Bible you could argue about, like, what well, does it mean this or does it mean... This one's very unambiguous. We are called to preach the gospel. Let's look at this one, this one verse here in Romans 10. Okay, so if you're not familiar with the Bible, Paul was an early follower of Jesus who wrote a bunch of letters to churches that were growing in this very beginning of the church. And he wrote to churches in Rome. And he said, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear? It's very logical, right? He's saying, we just sit around praying for people to find Jesus, but that's not good enough. How are they going to believe if they don't hear? How are they going to hear if someone doesn't preach? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the same word that the angels used when they talked to the shepherds and they said, we bring you good news of great joy for all people. This is the gospel message. And what we want to talk about is how the gospel message is inherently about talking about it. It's not something you just believe. In fact, I'm going to nerd out for a little bit here. Join me, if you will. There's three Greek words that can be translated to preach the good news. And the, I don't, can't pronounce any of them. All right? So, but the euangelizo, where, where we get evangelism from, that's the one that gets used the most often. And it, it means to announce the good news. Okay? So catch that. It's not just like to know the good news, to believe the good news. It's to announce the good news. Cariso is to proclaim. It's actually a, a, you know, we don't have heralds anymore. I mean, we have heralds with an O. We have them. But we don't have heralds with an A, right? Because we have social media and stuff like that or whatever. But this is like back in those days. They would go out and they would have people who would proclaim the news. And your job would be to run from town to town. Like the king is returned from battle. He's alive. Everybody gets the week off. And you would run from town to town and tell everybody that, okay? So it's to proclaim the message of the good news. So that is a Greek word that would be used. And another one is martis from where we get the word Martyr, yep, to be a witness. So this one will get translated witness to I have observed something and I'm, I didn't just observe it. I am now telling, I'm witnessing, I'm testifying in court or I'm testifying to you about the good news. So what's common with all three of these things is that they're all about Jesus, okay? It would be understood anytime any of these Greek words were used in the New Testament, everybody, there would have been no confusion about what news was being talked about. It wasn't like, oh, like good news about your sports team. Like you could use the Greek word there. No. Anytime it's used in the New Testament, it's talking about the news that Jesus came, died for our sins, rose from the dead, and invites you to eternal life with him. And the other thing is that it's meant to be told. Like the word to proclaim, to announce, to tell is baked into these words. When you read good news, it's often translated preach the good news. And that doesn't mean me. That doesn't mean you have to be a quote-unquote preacher. That's a newer thing that we've developed. Like that is all Christians were called to preach good news. Go out into all the world and make disciples, right, to preach the good news. We're all called to do this. You with me so far? So can I just go a little bit, another layer of nerdiness? All right, so Jesus, we've talked about this three weeks ago. Jesus his first kind of teaching, so he goes and gets tempted in the wilderness. He comes back. He walks into a synagogue, which is his, you know, their church, basically. And they had this um, 
tradition where they would open up a scroll, which is the old, part of the Old Testament, our Old Testament now, their scriptures, and they would read it, and then the, the, the rabbi teacher would talk about it. So he comes back, and starts his ministry, they open up to Isaiah 61, and he reads this. We've talked about this, right? He says, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. So he's quoting from Isaiah 61, which was written 700 years before he's reading it, okay? Because he's anointed me to proclaim, pay attention to that word, the good news. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, set oppressed free, and to, Josh, oh, he, he, he stopped paying attention for a half a second. Dean, proclaim the year of the Lord's reign. That was not a hard question. Oh, man. Kelly, did you distract him? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Telling a joke. All right. The common denominator is to proclaim the good news, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled out the scroll, gave it back to the tent. He sat down. Everyone looks at him because he's supposed to teach. I mean, we can't grasp the, like, momentous occasion that's happening. We can't grasp how this would have smacked people in the face. And he says, today this scripture is fulfilled. Right here. This is me. And then he goes, the, the verses later will say, then he went from town to town doing what? Preaching the good news. He was proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the gospel. And I want to just dig a little bit deeper. Because when he talks about proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor, does anybody even know what that means? It just sounds like a day that God's happy, right? Like, this is a good day. And, and maybe that's it. But it's actually referencing something that's even further back in the Israelite history. Are you with me still? Come on, this is going somewhere. Sometimes you gotta, you got to dig before you really unearth something. This is gold, I'm telling you. So he quotes Isaiah, which is 700 years old, and he refers to this year of the Lord's favor, which is referring to something in Leviticus 700 years before that. So 1,400 years before Jesus comes on the scene, God gives a bunch of rules to the Israelites on how to live. And one of those things is called the year of Jubilee. All right? So every seven years, they would have a Sabbath year, a year of no work and rest. You'd let the land rest, and it would be good for the land. You'd let your animals rest. You would rest. But every seven of those, so seven times seven is 49, every 49 years, they'd have a year of Jubilee. And this is what would happen in the year of Jubilee. No one would work all year long. Who's in? Let's go. No one works. And somehow, you're fine. Right? Like the way they had it set up, they would store up food and stuff like that. They'd have parties all through the year. Just It's a year of relaxing. If you were in debt, your debts were canceled. Who's in? Let's go. Credit card debt gone. Right? Your debt, literally. If you had had to, because land was like the big commodity, land and animals. So if you had had to give your land, some of your family's land away because of, you know, you needed money to buy grain or something like that, you would get that land back on the 49th year. Because your inheritance, that's your inheritance that you give to your next generation. So you got your inheritance back. Think about the depth of that meaning, okay? It's powerful, right? Indentured servants. So they had, the slaves were released. And, and, and their slavery wasn't like what we kind of, our modern concept of slavery. These were people who were in debt. And so instead of like being thrown in the debtor's jail, they would say, I will become your servant. I will work for Dean and Kay. And I will be your indentured servant until I pay off my debt. And if that were true and I still owed you $1,000, I'm released. Debts are forgiven. Prisoners are freed. Slaves are released. This is the year of Jubilee. That's why they call it the year. Everybody was happy. That was a good day, right, or a good year. A year of that. Imagine. Guess what? That's what Jesus is saying is being, pro he's proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. That's the year of Jubilee. He is saying today in your hearing, this is fulfilled. Now, if that doesn't get an amen, I don't know what does. So today in your hearing, we find true rest. Guess what? You never have to work for salvation again. You never have to do sacrifices. You never have to, uh, you know, fulfill certain obligations and follow all these rules. No, by the grace of Jesus Christ, you don't have to work for salvation. All of your debts to God are forgiven. Your sin is forgiven. Your identity as children of God, what your land is returned. Your inheritance is returned. You are freed from the bondage of sin, freed from the power of death. Scholar and author um, Michael Green wrote this 50 years ago in Evangelism in the Early Church, a great book. He says, at this time, he proclaims like a herald the year of the Lord 
when heralds proclaimed the year of Jubilee throughout the land with the sound of the trumpet, the year began. So it's just like, this is a new time. Jesus comes onto the scene, right? He's been baptized by John the Baptist. The Holy Spirit came upon him. God the Father said, this is my son. He gets tested in the wilderness and defeats the enemy. Then he comes out in the scene and he says, this is starting now. They blew the trumpets and the year would begin. So since that time, a new, a new era has become where the kingdom of God is amongst us. And then Jesus walked out of that room and he started healing people. He said, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he started delivering people. He said, the kingdom of God has come upon you. And he started preaching to people. He said, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Instead of this waiting and, and under the bondage of the prince of this world, under the bondage of the enemy and sin and fear and sickness, Jesus came and started to break all of those things. When the trumpet sounded, the year began, the prison doors opened, the debts were forgiven. The preaching of Jesus is such a blast of the trumpet. So I want you to hear that. Do you know anyone who needs to hear this good news? Listen, this is why Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because he was convinced it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who hears it. So going back to week one of this series, one of the reasons we hesitate to talk about our faith is that if we're honest with ourselves, we don't believe the gospel is powerful enough for the people we're talking to, myself included. I'm more worried about our relationship getting awkward than about the year of Jubilee happening in their life. I'm just, I know, it's kind of weird, like using this Old Testament lines, but think about it. Do you know anyone who needs a rest from constantly trying to achieve and get ahead? Do you know anyone who needs a rest from trying to prove their identity through works, through um, being perfect through, uh, you know, proving themselves with money or materialism or job recognition. Do you know anyone who needs freedom from the weight of their past that they carry around in them? That's, I've made these mistakes and I can't get past them. Do you know anyone who needs freedom from being unforgiven, from feeling like no one really understands them or no one really knows them? Or if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. Do you know anyone who needs to be fully accepted who they are right now? I mean, that's the good news that we offer. We offer something that doesn't require you to be perfect, that doesn't require you to come up with your own truth, that doesn't require you to run the show for your life, that doesn't require you to whatever you think of when the world without God. Think about that. I mean, we could go into a whole bunch of stuff about, like, the meaning of life, right? There's a whole lot of apologetics to talk about once you remove God. What is the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? So we, we hold all of this in our hands. This, this is the beautiful gospel message. I want you to hear, like this is the message that martyrs have died to protect over 2,000 years. To make sure that the message didn't get tainted, and it, it has, right? Like it's been tainted people, but like there are people who have shepherded it along throughout the years so that we would maintain this. That it didn't get corrupted to be like through works again. Like, you know, with, with the Catholic Church kind of before the Reformation where you could like pay money to get your sins forgiven. Weird stuff like that it would creep in and then people would come and, and they would lay their lives down to make sure that this beautiful gospel message would never be corrupted. That great, salvation is by faith alone through grace so that no one can boast. That no one is too low, too far, too broken the thing that's beautiful about Christianity is even right off the bat, it broke all the rules of society. It was men and women. It was poor and rich. It was slave and free. It was multiple nationalities, multiple skin colors. Everyone was welcome at the table. Everyone was welcome at the table. And there's this beautiful gospel message that our world still needs. And for better or for worse, we carry that. And so what are we going to do with it? We're going to do with that. Proclaiming the truth, proclaiming the gospel message is baked into the idea of the gospel. All right, if I haven't convinced you of that, then I don't know. I, that's all I got, all right? That's all I got. But you, 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 when you talk about the gospel, part and parcel of the gospel is we talk about the gospel. You can't, it's like, it's like you can't take it. It's like talking about football but not using a football, right? Like, or trying to play football without a football. The gospel is meant to be talked about. It's meant to be said out loud. So, that's the theological part of my teaching. Now I want to give you practical advice, and then we're going to end.
But it's important we know, like, that we have a rich, 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 deep history. It's not just pastors get up and say, you should talk about your faith. Because we're trying to, like, what, build our church and, you know, make more money or feel better about ourselves. Like, this is a, this is, we're part of this beautiful 2,000-year-old, and, and, and actually we're, we're married to the Jewish tradition, so it's thousands of years old tradition of being a blessing to all people, bringing good news to the world who needs it. That's who the church, that's our identity, we get away from it sometimes. So here's my practical application. And the question I would ask is, what would happen if we just started talking about Jesus more? I'm not saying you have to know everything about the Bible. I'm not saying you have to be able to explain everything. In fact, one of the most powerful things you can say to someone is, I'm not sure, but I still believe. I don't know. Let's go find that out together, okay? What if we just start talking about Jesus more? What if we became, you know, like, like we are here in a small group? Like the people that we are everywhere, at work and at family and in the grocery store. What if we just start talking about Jesus more? So the first one is, I'll be praying for you. I think this is like entry level and it's good to do. It's very simple. I don't think I've ever had anyone say no. I don't think I've ever had anyone get mad at me when I say, can I just pray, can I pray for you? Not, I'm, sometimes I say, can I pray for you right here? Some people say no to that. But just like, hey, can I pray for you? Recently, someone was texting me, and um, I don't know if they're a Christian or not. Like, I don't know their faith background. I work with them in another part of my life, and they, you know, they were like, hey, I'm not going to be able to get this thing to you in time because we had a death in the family. It's really sudden. I'm going to be leaving for the weekend. And, like, so it's like, okay, like, what do you do? I'm going to say, like, you know, like, oh, you know, thoughts and prayers. One of my huge pet peeves. What does it mean to send thoughts at somebody? It's not, it means nothing. You, I can't send my, can you feel my thoughts? No. There's nothing there. Right? Anyway, sorry. Side note. Right? What am I going to do? Am I going to say like some innocuous, socially acceptable thing? Because this person, I don't think they're a Christian. I know them through a secular job of mine. Like say like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like what's really acceptable? Let me know if I can do anything. Which I'm not going to do anything. And so I was like, well, if this was my friend from church, what would I say? What would you say? What if I just talked about Jesus more? What, uh, what, the very lowest thing I would say, the very minimum I would say would be, can I pray for you? Like, or, or Mandy and I will be praying for you this week. I have little cards that I write people's names on so I don't forget. I'll, well, I'll be praying for you every day this week. So I thought, well, what do I have to lose? I mean, is that, is there, is that really offensive? Like, is it offensive to tell a person who doesn't believe in God that I'll be praying for them? It, the very least, they're like, okay, well, that's nice of you. I'll just count it as thoughts. <laughs> Sorry. So I said, yeah, I'll be, uh, listen, that's really hard. And I said, I, I'm a Christian, you know, and I, I, I believe in God, and I'm going to be praying for you, you know, so whatever, something. Like, like, he comforts you or whatever. And she was like, that means so much to me. Thank you so much. And she said, actually, you know, like, she told me a little bit about her faith background and you just never know. Like we, I talked about this last week, but we think we know everything, right? We're like, in this situation, we're like, I, I know this lady would hate if I said this, but like, you don't know. What if she needs someone to pray for her? So at the very least, can we just say, do this? We just, like, it's like, it's like loosening up the, like, get, getting the juices flowing for us to talk about our faith more outside of church. Like, I, listen, I'll be praying for you. It's, it's pretty, you know, it's very low risk. It's, but it's getting you talk. It's opening the door a little bit. And then you, you know what really makes it powerful? If you remember to pray for them. <laughs> so do it. Write it down. Pray for them. And then even more, like you would take another step, follow up. Hey, I've been praying for you. How are things going? There's something really powerful about that. You never know what doors that might open, okay? Number two. Remark on what's remarkable. So here's the thing. City Light, you've heard me talk about this before. City Light, uh, part of our vision is to provide remarkable things for you to talk about, to make your job easier when you're talking to your friends and family and neighbors and coworkers about God. So what I mean about this is like, okay, so I was uh, running a, a soccer practice this months ago, you know, at a public school, and I got a phone call in the middle of it, and so I had to stop practice and take this phone call, and it was Tom Perso, and he was at, the, we, this was during the summer when we were helping this, um, this refugee family get settled in Wilmington, Delaware. And so I had to, like, coordinate with him and this pastor, and, and so I got done with that, and I got off the phone call. And I was like, okay, what do I say to this team? I can say, 
oh, sorry guys, I just had a work call, right? Really innocuous. Or I could like remark on what's remarkable. And I say, you guys know what's so cool? We, our church is helping this refugee family. I'm not really talking about Jesus yet, right? And so, but like, and in this context, I have to be careful. But I'm, t- I'm remarking on what's remarkable. I'm, I'm, if anything, I'm, you know, one of the ways that we talk about God is to make his name famous. That's the kind of a saying that gets talked about in the Bible sometimes. Like, let's glorify the name of Jesus. So in this moment, I'm, I think just talking about good things that the church is doing can at the very least break down some barriers that people have towards church. Because especially today, right? They, a lot of bad thoughts about church. So I just said, isn't this so cool? We got this opportunity. We're partnering with this organization. We're settling two families in Wilmington. We bought them a whole bunch of stuff yesterday. We painted their whole apartment. We bought them air conditioning units. We bought toys for their kid. We bought pans and pots and cleaning. And we moved everything in. We built the furniture. Like that's a remarkable thing for anyone but I want to point towards Jesus. You can do this. Like, that's why we do things like the Easter bunny hunt. Like, it's not because we love the Easter bunny, right? We put those Easter bunnies all over Newark because it's something to talk about. And it's not why we do a lot of our outreaches, but our outreaches are remarkable. If you get involved in these things, it's so easy to be like, well, you know, what did you do this week? Well, I went and served with Foster Well. What's Foster Well? I went and served with 1 in 7B. What's 1 in 7B? You know, like those are things that you can get involved in, that you can talk about church. You can just talk about, remark about what's remarkable. It just opens the door. You never know. Colossians tells us to let our conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer everyone. There's this, I just think there's this sense of like, can we more often sprinkle talk about God into our conversations? Right? It, it, it's, a, it's who we are. You can't get away from it. Like, I wonder if we could have conversations at work. We talk about everything. Like, you know, it's like, hey, uh, you know, I, was, I saw this great movie this week. I went to this great restaurant this week. My kid had a game this week. I mean, how weird is it? You're like, yeah, we were at church. Church was really good this week. I don't know. Can you do that? I heard a great message at church this week, and he was really, I mean, maybe not this particular message, but pick one of my other ones, you know? And, like, and he was really, in, you know, talking about being at peace or, you know, whatever. Like, Every, something everyone can use. I mean, is that crazy? My kids had a great time at church this week. Oh, your kids go to church? Yeah, we go every week. Like, my kids love it there. Your kids like church? I mean, these are conversations that are just waiting to happen. But you, you and I are just so afraid and prideful. We think we know what's going to happen. If I mention church, they're just going to back right out of that conversation, probably never talk to me again, and I'll get fired. Probably not. I mean, you got to know, I mean, I know, I don't know all your situations, but like, to be honest, most of us probably aren't like pushing the pedal too hard. If, if anything, we're probably here, right? I just wonder if there's more opportunities. Number three, now we're ramping it up. Okay? We can tell your story in God's moments. And what I mean by that is you, if you're, especially if you're seasoning your conversation, right? If you're like dropping hints and like looking for open doors and like, oh yeah, yeah, my church does that or we did this or whatever, you know, all that stuff that I just said, one and two, there will be open doors eventually. And here's the thing, people in our society right now are more interested in what works for you than what is actually true. And so use that to our advantage. Don't lead with, I've got this book that proves Christianity, would you like to read it? Lead with your story. Talk about how God has changed your life. Talk about it. The Bible, um, Jesus, this is Jesus talking to the disciples, and he said, you will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's that third Greek word, martis, right? You'll be my witnesses. You will tell about how you, what you have seen. What have you seen? How have you seen God in your life? That's your story. You know, where were you without Jesus? How did you meet Jesus? How has Jesus changed your life? Or how are you different? I mean, this is just like a model of how you could tell your story in 30 seconds. I I do evangelism classes sometimes here. I do it sometimes with the teenagers. And we'll practice this. We'll do a 30-second version and a five-minute version. I'd encourage you to get in front of the mirror and just talk about it. Have you ever told anyone the story of your faith? If you've never done it, maybe you should practice first. But just be like, you know, 
If I didn't have Jesus in my life, I don't know the kind of, I know what kind of father and husband I would be. I know how selfish I am with that. I mean, you, you, what's your story? What has Jesus done for you? Because you get into these situations by praying for someone, like, yeah, I've been thinking about going to church. This happens to me all the time. Just because I'm willing to talk about church or God, this I get all the time. Yeah, we've been thinking about going. Do we keep meeting to get back to church? Or It's been so long. I get that all the time. And, I can, and then I'm just like, yeah, well, you're probably going to hell because of that. You know, and I just walk away. You know, I'm like, you're out. Yeah. So I, <laughs> you, weren't more, you weren't ready for that, were you? No, so I, I, I walk through that open door. And I'm like, you know, I don't know where we'd be without, sometimes I talk about the power of church in our life. And I'll just go, like, we've had some really, really hard times in our life. And the church has come around us like nobody else. I, I can't tell you how important it's been for us to have a community of faith. I mean, there's just, like, you, if you're just willing to talk about it. Like, what if we talked about Jesus more? Last one, we can learn to tell God's story. And this is, like, this is it, right? This is the furthest one. This is the one we're all scared of. See how I did this? I tried to bait you into this. And you're like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. Well, maybe. No way. All right. So... It's okay. This is for everybody, though. Please hear this. This is not just for pastors or special people. This is for all of us. On some level, the Bible tells us to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Okay? Why do you believe? But do this with gentleness and respect. Hello? Don't you wish, like, large swaths of the Christian culture would hear that verse right there? Okay? Keeping a clear conscience so that, right, clear conscience, don't be, don't be too much of a hypocrite, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. What's going on here? Right, this is like in the mid-60s AD, and Christians were kind of like looked down upon by Romans. They were, they were actually called atheists because Christians refused to believe in the pantheon of gods. They, they maintained there was one God. So isn't that weird? They were called atheists. It's very interesting. They refused to worship um, Caesar as a divine being. And so they were looked down upon. They were, um, they were often kind of feared as being weird or different. Um, when, the, when Rome was burned, I think it was 64 AD, Christians were blamed. Okay? That's how society thought about this. Oh, that was, I really need the next slide. That scared me. Okay. That's how society, so he's in the midst of this Peter's writing. Because this was written in the mid-60s, right around that time. Peter's writing and he's saying, listen, be ready to tell people why you're doing these good works because they don't understand. They think you're terrible people, right? And we get that today. Don't we get that more than, I mean, more than ever in my life today, I feel that way. I'm leaning into doing good works because I want to lead with that. So we're going to talk about that next week. Check this out. This is from the same book. There was no getting away from the fact that Christians were different. Honestly, I love that. I highlighted that when I read that. It's great. We should be different. There was an awareness among the pagans, it's just a word used for non-Christians, that Christians constituted a third type of person in the world. So there were Romans, there were Jews, and then there was this other weird type of people called Christians. This was all very disturbing and took a lot of living down for a Christian who was anxious to introduce his pagan friends to Christ. So we're, we're in the same spot that the early Christians were in. They were... They, they had a lot of, like, bad press to live down as they tried to tell their neighbors about Jesus. Don't you feel that way sometimes? Right? So, and that's okay. Like, we can work through that, but we've got to be willing to talk about it. We've got to be willing to talk about what God's doing in our lives. So at some point, we might get to getting to tell God's story. And God's story for me is just, it's just talking about, I use the model of relationship. There's lots of different ways to tell the story of God, right? But I just talk about God wants to have a relationship with each of us. That's what he longs for. And our rebellion, our, our desire to be in charge of our own lives broke that relationship as if someone that you were really good friends with cheated on you or went behind your back. Like that's what we've done to God. But in God's great mercy and love, he sent Jesus to repair that relationship. And now no matter what we've done, we can have unfiltered relationship with God. If we just accept it, it's like this free gift that we can get from Jesus. It's got no religious baggage like the other world religions. It's got no, like, jump through these hoops. You just say yes to relationship, right? That's like nutshell God's story. That's how I would do it, but there's lots of ways you can do it. But I'm just saying, do you, have you thought about what you would say if someone said, tell me why you believe? Have you even thought about what you would say? It might be good. 
It might be good to think about it. I, I really think that the more we talk about God and that because we're a very invitational church, you're going to find yourself in situations where you're going to be talking about Jesus. So I'm, I'm laying this out there, right? Like I told you, this is my least favorite teaching of, this whole, of the whole series. I don't want to put this on you in an obligatory way. I don't want you to walk away feeling condemned. I know that it's uncomfortable. I know it's awkward. But like I said last week, if you knew a million dollars was buried somewhere, would you tell your friends? And it was like this, this magical place where every time someone took it, there was more there. Okay, so just think about that, right? Like if I tell you, you go get it, and then I tell you, it's still there, right? Everybody gets a million dollars. I would never hesitate. You know, so like, I just think maybe we could get more on the front foot about the gospel. Maybe we could be less ashamed to talk about it, less afraid. Maybe we could just start to talk about Jesus more, what would happen, and just let the chips fall where they may. Maybe we don't need to control every situation. Maybe we just need to open the door for God and just say, All right, I'm going to start talking about it more and, and let God handle the consequences let God handle what happens next. I'm not great at this, but I've been trying. And I have a video to show you of a friend of mine who wasn't a friend when I met him. And it was one of those situations where the Holy Spirit starts to work, and, and he just started talking about his life. And I had this opportunity to be like, just listen and be like, oh, it's great, thanks. And, and I was buying some weights from him, like, you know, and put him in the car and leave. But I felt like this moment in the Holy Spirit, like, what am I going to do? And so I'm going to share this, this video with you guys, and then we'll end. Worship team, you can come up. My name is John Abicini. Uh, my wife is Jill uh, Abicini. Uh, we've been going to this church about a year and a half. Also, he loves so Christmas. So prior uh, to me uh, actually going to the church, um, I was separated from my wife. My wife got cancer. Um, I wasn't a very good person uh, during this. Um, I took it more offensively uh, for myself. Um, so it led for me and my wife to kind of separate. I personally thought once I walked out the door um, that me and my wife would divorce and I probably would not uh, you know, be married anymore. Um, thinking of all the crazy things, a single life again, starting all over. So. Those are my thoughts. Um, I had 18, or at that time, 16 years with my wife. Um, I never thought I'd ever be divorced from my wife. Every winter, or every uh, winter, I'll buy a ton of weights. I work out through the winter, and I sell them in the summer. Happened to start selling my weights. <clears throat> I put them online, Facebook. Um, a guy, put, you know, asked about them, all that stuff. I gave it to him. He's like, "Yeah, I'll take them. Whatever case, when can we meet? Whatever case may be." Um, we met. Um, so he comes to my house, we're in the driveway, we're loading them up. Um, the guy really never said much to me. We're just loading the weights. I'm spilling my guts. He asked me a few questions. Somehow, I don't know, I started telling my entire life, telling him where I was, what I'm going to do. But I said, I got to go to church. I said, you know, I've been a Christian all my life. I said, right now, I think my life is upside down. I said, you know, with this COVID, I said, I've had a, had a church. I said, I used to go in Dover. I said, but I just got to get to a church. And he was just steady. We're loading the weights again. I thought, well, whatever. He's not going to say anything. He didn't say too much. We loaded the weights in his car, which is kind of cool. And at the end, you know, all of a sudden he says, hey, I'm a pastor at City Light Church. Why don't you come? I was like, man, like, this is crazy. I literally, um, my body was almost like it was, it, it came out and went back in because I just thought, oh, my God, I want to go to church. This guy tells me, to me, it's one of the biggest signs you can think of, like, if you ever know God, how God works, he puts things right there in a place for you that you just don't understand. That Sunday, I went to the church. I fell in love with the church. I fell in love with Chris and stuff. Started meeting more on a regular basis, uh, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, talking, um, getting involved in church, just going every, and every time I went, every Sunday, uh, whatever sermon he would give, I swear to God, there was nobody in the church. It was just me and him my whole life. It was in front of me what to do and what not to do. Um, started telling my wife about it. You know, we were talking, boom, boom, boom. Um, we started becoming closer, maybe, even though we, you know, we were married X amount of years, but um, she started seeing a difference. The church was helping me. Um, my sessions was Christian, was helping me. And then I go on a retreat. Uh, I meet Dan, I meet Mark, I meet some great people, his dad, 
was in my little group. Uh, just the people in there were just, I just could sense a sense of realness. There wasn't nothing fake. Uh, me and Mark became close. I got into one and seven B. Me and Dan became real close. Uh, he talks to me on a regular basis. So being in this church, I found home. I found uh, substance. I found I found real people that I think that I can talk to because um, I don't have too much of a family. So I expressed a lot of personal things with these guys. Um, they never looked at me in a different way. So all all the best way I can say to to you know end something like my story and there's much more to tell if you ever wanted to you know uh, ask me or uh, maybe we could do this again one time is that is that weight thing like I, I, I can't ex like uh, express that day to me where to me it was life-changing for somebody else it might be just a coincidence or yes whatever but to me it wasn't we were put together for a purpose and I think even the church and Dan and still where we're at today we're all we're all in this together and somehow we've intertwined right now and that's why to me it's life changing because my life has changed in a, in a totally different way it's hard to explain so for anybody that's out there really watching this or whatever you know and if you just have faith on, on a constant basis and believe and really trust God and you pray I believe without question your prayers will be answered.